Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz. And in the introduction to last week's interview of Christina Matucci, I gave a lot of detail about my month-long getaway in Maui, and I'm now back home, and while it's truly a relief to be back with my wonderful wife and back into the swing of things with my business, Kushner Entertainment, I definitely miss the experiences of being in the presence of such stunning nature with the ocean and mountains, as well as all the friends that I hung out with, which included new friends I made while on the island. And I actually was able to hear a lot of great music. I mean, it's just amazing how many great musicians and artists live there. Um, The bottom line is that it was an extremely restorative trip. I feel more grounded, relaxed, and grateful, really grateful for all that I have in my life. And I can't recommend enough making the time, creating the time and space to go to another environment for an extended period of time. And not only having that time with a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, but also carving out a good chunk of alone time. I mean, it just really helps to give a refreshed perspective on your life. And so, I'm, I'm just so grateful to have have been able to, to go. Um, so, if you missed last week's episode, it was with Christina Matucci, Executive Director with David Beam Experiences, and we focused our latest conversation on how to become or level up your skills as a speaker. Today's interview is a revisit of my first interview of Lewis Miller, a floral designer and founder of Lewis Miller Design out of New York City. Clients include leading industry professionals in fashion, design, photography, art direction, and architecture, such as Bugari, Carolina Herrera, Chanel, Tiffany, Versace, Bergdorf Goodman, the Whitney Museum, and more. Lewis has a great backstory about he came to be in New York City. It's really fun to hear. And he also talks about his process with clients and how he gets inspired for his designs and so much more. We edited out most of the talk about COVID, but there's still some references to it, so you'll hear a little bit of that. And be sure to listen to my follow-up interview with Lewis two years later, which was episode number 448. So enjoy this conversation with Lewis Miller. Lewis, it is so good to have you back on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be fun. So first of all, I, you know, in looking up some information on you, I see that you have this nickname, the Banksy of Floral Design. You've got, am I accurate? Am I saying that right? The Banksy of Flowers, I think is how it was coined. Yeah. The Banksy of Flowers. So yes, that nickname is going around. And what does that mean? (laughs) Well, that's based on my flower flashes, which are, you know, my street installations that I do at night, which are very random pop-up, you know, installations of flowers throughout Manhattan and kind of very unexpected spaces. So, you know, nobody really, you know, sees me doing them. They just wake up and there they are. So I think, I don't know, it was Vogue or New York Times or somebody coined that phrase a long time ago and it kind of stuck and others picked up on it. So. It could be worse. Other, if I were the Banksy of Flowers, I wouldn't be talking about it right now. But <laughs> it's an honor. Whatever, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Well, while we're on it, in terms of these, like I guess, pop up kind of flower that you're doing in the middle of the night. I mean, are you having? You're not getting licenses, or you're not checking with with the with the the state. Nothing like that. You're just doing this wherever you feel in the middle of the night. I mean, can I, I've looked up some of it, Lewis. I mean, let me say I've seen some of the pictures where there's just these unbelievable um, flowers popping out of trash cans and out of uh, around parking meters and and statues that are in the city i mean it is incredible i mean like it it blows me away what what is the story behind you doing that so yeah thank you i mean it's i guess in october geez that's almost next month a month or so it's going to be four years since the first one so the whole idea of how it all started was that you know, I've always felt a little bit, let me, how do I say this? I've always felt a little bit of angst, I guess, and being a floral designer. I think that, you know, I felt sometimes like maybe my only, all I was doing was making rich people's lives prettier. And it didn't seem that um, noble of a calling. <laughs> um, but finally, I got over that after a while um, and realized that everybody needs beauty. But, you know, I, I love flowers and I know the importance of flowers. And, you know, 
years ago, I was thinking like, God, wouldn't it be fun? You know, I also love New York. I love the city. I love the juxtaposition. But somehow to kind of have this esoteric installation of flowers completely out of the context and out of the norm of how I'm used to doing flowers, you know, which are, you know, in a tent, in a ballroom, in a, in a very curated space, but instead have this be a much more sort of artistic expression, um, you know, and, and juxtaposition and a clash of sort of like, you know, the, the, the blossom with its lo- location. Yes. A little idea kind of didn't go anywhere for a very long time. Didn't really go anywhere at all. And then so basically that's like it's a whole series of channels that led to to led the kind of all converged into one major major uh river here. Um the second one being I remember it was probably gee 10 years or, or so ago I remember coming home from my studio at the time it was in the East Village. And it was like a Friday evening. I don't think I had an event that weekend, so you know, I was bringing an armload of leftover flowers in my arms, taking them home to my apartment. I was walking counter, like I was walking from the East Village to the West Village, and I was going past all the people that were coming from Midtown. They've gotten off the subway, and they were looking at, like, they saw these, like, this, you know, armload of flowers. And I was so struck at how, like, kind of, like, literally, it was like desire in their eyes. Like, they yeah. weren't looking at me, but they were looking at this, like, kind of, you know, walking to the East Village, which can be a bit crummy sometimes, and seeing these, this beautiful, you know, explosion and and then getting on the subway it's like wow how to like sort of make people look at you is to carry flowers and i really was struck by that and i think i was struck by that because you know working with flowers all the time to me it's like the furniture it's like the wallpaper it's yeah, you know, right. it's, it's, it becomes a given right and it reminded me and it really reminded me of how how powerful they are so that's that was channel number two channel number three as my business continued to grow and um and and do well um, you know, it got, it was good. There was no complaint, but that to me, um, is a little boring. And I started to think like, you know, I've done this for a while. I'm getting older. Like how, how can I give back? That's sort of in a, a way that's meaningful, that's fresh to me. And that's kind of the third, well, actually there's four, well, four channels. So that's the third one. And then the fourth one was just being a little bit creatively challenged, everything going well, kind of like don't rock the boat, but like now suddenly we have the, um, the, the, like all of, all of a sudden we have Instagram and, and Pinterest and like social media. So flowers are everywhere and I, it's starting to all look the same. And I was just like getting a little bit antsy from all of that. So take those four things and put them together. You know, it became as like, you know, it, that's where the flower flash started. It became um, kind of an experiment, sort of like, you know, I want to do this. I don't know if anybody's going to like it. It doesn't matter if they don't like it. What I love about it is it's not a tra- financial transaction, so I don't have to uh, meet anybody's expectations. I can literally right. do it for myself. Yeah. And the first one was in October of 2016, and it was the night after, it was the morning after a particularly horrendous political debate. And everybody was feeling like shit, honestly. And so it's like, you know what, let's, we had a bunch of flowers come in from a mid, uh, midweek event and we just took them all and threw the empty, all these bags came in and we emptied them all on the studio floor and started separating them and went up next morning to Central Park at 5 a.m. and did this very simple, but very kind of day glow halo of flowers around the John Lennon Imagine Memorial. And that, that was kind of it. Like that was it. And then it just kind of started to, well, first of all, it was a, it was so much fun. It's such a dopamine rush. And, um, you know, it was so inspiring, creatively, you know, satisfying for me that it's sort of like, I want to do more. I want to do more. And a part of the reason why I love it is just because it's also a very fast process, you know, which is exactly the opposite of designing a wedding. Yeah. Well, <laughs> And I'm looking, like right now, I'm looking at the pictures. I mean, they're coming out of mailboxes, the subway stations, they're around a hot dog stand, construction. So people wake up in the morning and they see this. Uh, I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's a little bit like, you know, I mean, you know, pre-COVID, the idea was like, we're all stressed out. The whole world, we're doing too many things at once. And, you know, we're addicted to our phones and like, wake up, turn the corner, and like have this kind of larger than life only in New York. What the hell am I seeing? This right. is crazy kind of, kind of vision in front of you. And, you know, and it's very ephemeral. So it may last two hours. It may last 15 minutes, depending on yeah when the Department of Sanitation comes around. It makes <laughs> me think, I mean, it's way more beautiful than this, but it makes me think back in the late seventies and the eighties when I would hang out in the city and, you know, there'd be graffiti and murals and, you know, then <laughs> they'd be washed a few days ago. They'd yeah. pop up somewhere else. 
So, you know, in terms of your history, I understand that you grew up somewhere in California in farm country. Is that right? I did. I grew up in the very beautiful, I say that's tongue firmly planted in cheek, um, <laughs> the very beautiful Modesto, California. So it was, I come from a family of in agriculture and farming. You know, we were, my father, grandfather, and uncles, they, they did well in the almond peaches. You know, it's the land of you know, blue diamonds. So there was, that's how I grew up. It was a lot of, you know, it was a, it was a rural community, so to speak, but about an hour and a half South of San Francisco, Sacramento, um, kind of, kind of the middle of nowhere. But you know, what was great is I grew up with things growing around me. So while it's not the most picturesque of places, it has this environment where everything grows like crazy. And that's, that was my, that was my takeaway from it. Well, and I know that when you were 18, you moved to Seattle, you studied horticulture and uh, landscape design. So your love of of what you just, just described, you know, where you grew up, obviously, that was really more than just a hobby for you. I guess that, I mean, it, so it, it kind of continued from very young child all the way through to where you actually majored in it. Yeah, I mean, it's really very much an organic process from my, you know, from my, from my whole life, from my very earliest days, because, you know, we had the gardens, we had the flowers, I loved them. But I also, you know, my, my parents and grandparents, they were also very much, you know, they were into antiques. And, you know, and I loved and I loved, you know, I loved beautiful things. And I was always kind of a little bit starving for more and more beauty. And to be able to design and create beauty was great. And to create kind of create a situation with flowers or create an environment that was temporary was even kind of more great. So, and, 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 you know, I thought, you know, I kind of struggled with where am I going to go? I think I thought, you know, do I want to do fashion? Do I want to do be an architect and, and landscape design sort of is where I ended up um, because that was design, but it was also something that I could relate to with my background. Um, so my family moved to Washington state to Columbia Valley in 1990. And then in 93, um, I moved to Seattle and went to school for horticulture and landscape design there, which I enjoyed. Seattle was amazing. It is amazing. It was. It's a. It's a horticulture. It's like the horticultural paradise of you know North mm. America. Uh -huh. um, so that was a really great experience. But then that one thing led to another, and that kind of turned into floral design slash event design. But it was you know it's just it was just a very organic process. My process started when I was born. It wasn't this sort of like pivotal moment necessarily. Yeah, but then you decided, from what I understand, to move to New York City in 2000. Now, that's, I mean, that's quite a shift across the country. What what drove you to, to make that move? Yeah, that was one of those, that was one of those pivotal moments where I can look back and know that, you know, I had to make a change and that kind of I had no clear answer. And then suddenly I did and I had no alternative, like I knew what I had to do. And it's very funny because it was, I had been working in Seattle. And I'd actually been working at a private golf club in Seattle for about seven years. And, you know, I had been experimenting with them and doing the flowers and doing the, uh, the landscaping and growing things. And then I, I met my good friend, Deborah, and she did a lot in the wedding industry. So I started helping her with weddings. And so we worked together for about six or seven years. And I was dating this guy at the time. And this was 2000. And Deborah and I had just finished doing Bill Gates, his millennial um, party, the wow. flowers for his millennial um, New Year's Eve party. And, you know, kind of feeling good about things, riding a little high. We were all a little bit um, not really knowing what's going to happen. Well, actually, Y2K didn't happen. So we felt great. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember yeah, that. Yeah. So that was all fine and dandy. And um, I woke up one morning and then my boyfriend at the time, we were actually planning a trip to New York in february so you know a month and a half later over valentine's day and what started out as is going to be a holiday and i had never been here before turned into something else because one morning and honestly he is the reason why i'm here um, one morning we woke up and it was this like perfect cold january perfectly clear which is very rare in january in seattle uh, morning sunday morning and he just looked at me he's like you know you need to uh you need to move to new york he said, you know, you're getting, and he was, he was about 10 years older than I am. I was at the time. And he said, you're getting used to creature comforts here in Seattle. There's no doubt you're going to be a success if you stay here, but you're going to be a big fish in a small pond. And if you don't make the move now while you're flexible, it'll never happen. Huh. 
And it was such a moment of clarity. I'm like, I had never been to New York. I've never been to Manhattan. I'm actually terrified to go because I thought she had to be wealthy just to visit, like let alone move there. I have no idea how it's going to happen. But I know that this is, it's so crystal clear. This is what my next move is going to be. So I literally, you know, sort of like there was, it was just very obvious. That's what was going to happen. So we took the trip and I, instead of it being like a holiday, I, I hit the ground running and I, you know, I, I feel like I, I just went in, I went into every flower shop everywhere. I'd made a few appointments earlier and I just had thrown together a little a portfolio and I just went and I got, you know, I got like six job offers and, oh my I, and I was like, and a month and a half later in March, I moved with the suitcase. Wow. Fantastic. Found it a place to rent online. Yeah. Barely, barely had online back then. Right. But. Right. <laughs> So, yeah, that's how it all started. And I thought I was going to come here and, and I thought I honestly was fully anticipating to come here and move into interior design. That was really my objective. I'm huh. like, you know, flowers are great, but I've done it. I've done it, you know, my whole life. I was, you know, 25 at the time. So that was a very big, long life I had lived. And I thought I was t- over it <laughs> and had all the answers. And I thought I want to move into interior design. But then I got here and the reality of having to make a living and live in New York quickly set in. Well, and then wasn't it only a couple of years later that you ended up launching your own company? I did. So 2002, I, I launched my own company. I started, I'd started taking some classes at New York School of Interior Design. I'm like, this is great. But then I realized like to get a job for an interior designer, I would be, you know, filing carpet swatches and something and I'd be doing it for like no dollars an hour. Um, and in turn, I'm like, well, I can't, obviously that's not going to work because I'd have to pay rent. So you know, the, my, I, 2002, um, that was the next big pivotal moment is like, I woke up and it's like, you know, it's time to do something else. And I was living in the East village with my partner and down the street was this little for rent sign on a, I don't know, it was like some defunct tiny little space. And it was just like, you know, what if we just start something small and keep it under the radar? And I'm like, well, I thought I was coming here to do interior design, but then again, but my love of flowers and, and especially being in Manhattan now, like, and, and going from Seattle, which is the greenest city to New York, which is far from that, you know, my complete love and, and nest and, you know, and, and need for flowers and nature had, had grown even more and more. And so it's like, well, I think this idea of like doing it and doing it, you know, my way sounds great. So why not, you know, once again, 27 years old, completely fearless, um, just jumped into it and, that was the start. Well, see, and that's what I was I was about to say. It takes so much courage, especially, I mean, look, it takes it anywhere to, you know, leave comfort of a job and start your own business, but especially in as competitive as an environment as New York City. I mean, it, you were literally, you really felt fearless. You were just like, I'm going to do it. There was no hesitation, fear, anxiety, not much. No, there really wasn't. You know, there was just like, listen, I'm like, I knew that I'm in the city of greats and, you know, and that's what's so fabulous about New York. And this was 2002. And like, there are so many amazing, awesome designers that I looked up to and, you know, still do. And, and it was just like, I had no intention to like... I don't know. I just needed to make a living. It was more than I needed to make a living and I need, and I need to do something that I know how to do and I love doing. So it was kind of like, it, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like there was a lot of, um, not that there weren't a lot of options. It's just that, that it was like, it just seemed very natural that that's what it would be. Yeah. Well, look, you had already made the, the shift, which is a big one to go from Seattle and what you were doing there, even just to moving to New York city. So, I mean, yeah. well, so then were your first jobs uh, weddings? I mean, you were solidly in the event industry. Is that how you started your company? No, it really wasn't. You know, it started out just very small, doing more gift arrangements, um, you know, kind of a little bit more traditional flower shop, per se. Um, and then, you know, I had met some... Being that I had worked here, worked in the industry for two years, I had made some contacts and, and worked with planners and met planners and... You know, and they they came to me, and slowly the job started coming in, and um, it just one thing led to another. You know, I it was a very it was a very small operation. It was me, and then it was you know, then after a year, it was me and one other person, and after another year, it was me and another part time person. Like it just became you know, it was so so slowly grown. Um, I never really jumped into it like this is hello hurrah here's lmd and this is what we're doing it was was a much more um 
I wouldn't say calculated, but it was just a very like it was just it was a slow process. So what percentage of your business is weddings versus other types of events? I would say, well, I would say if I did the average over the last 18 years, it was probably easily 80 to 90 percent weddings. I would say now that 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 might be closer to 60 to 70 percent weddings just because we're now doing a lot more corporate stuff and other collaborations. But definitely the lion's share of the jobs for weddings. And and our weddings, yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure that you're aware of two other shows that are on the Wedding Biz Network. First are two seasons of Stop and Smell the Roses, hosted by well-known event designer Preston Bailey. Preston speaks with such an honest and sincere voice. This is the only platform in which you can hear this legend of the industry share secrets to his success. Also... Check out the 140 episodes of The Business of Being Creative, hosted by Sean Lowe. Sean's consulting firm, The Business of Being Creative, is full of topics and advice for any creative business with a focus on the event and interior design industry. You can find both shows at theweddingbiznetwork.com or on your cell phone's podcast app for both Stop and Smell the Roses and The Business of Being Creative. So, Lewis, what, what is your process you know, how do you go about coming up with, with the designs and how do you work with the client so that you, you know, come up with your own vision of how to um, do this? H- how does that go for you? So I, I guess I should say right now, maybe this is not necessarily a good thing to say on a wedding podcast, but you know, it's like, it's never, it's my, my love has always been design and creating design and flowers. And however that may be, it's just weddings are where, they, it tends to be. So it's not that I'm like romancing weddings so much. I, I'm not married. I think weddings are lovely, but to me, weddings are, a, are an outlet for me to do what I love to do. Mm-hmm. And so that's always uh, been kind of my, um, from day one, that's always been my kind of, you know, my approach to it. So, you know, which is good because I ended up attracting a clientele that, you know, they wanted, um, they wanted it to be a wedding, but at the end of the day, it didn't need to be just this sort of like all white thing, you know, candelabras, like your classic quintessential wedding. It was like, it, 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 it needed to be a little bit more personal, much more unique. And so that, and that's also what I love, you know, like I, I've never been a designer who, of course I could do what I love all the time, but I also like to be challenged and, um, I find it a lot more interesting for me to <clears throat> kind of jump into a client's headspace and their taste. And even if sometimes their taste is not my own or it's slightly questionable yeah. and, and, and put my spin on it and figure out how to, you know, not shirk away from it and how to make it work. So that's, you know, so my approach has very much been that way. It's really about starting the process with them. And, you know, like I, I would always say to my brides, like, you know, don't necessarily bring me pictures of, of flowers or other people's weddings. You know, I'd rather see, like, imagine this is, you know, this room and this environment and this space is your backdrop. And if I'm, if somebody's painting your portrait, you know, if John Singer Sargent, you know, came out of the grave and is going to paint this gorgeous portrait of you and your fiance and in this beautiful room, you know, what, what does that room look like? You know, huh. what is that space? And so when people think about it that way, it's a much more sort of lifestyle approach. It's less like, huh, okay. It's less about like, oh, well, we have to have the centerpieces be this. It's much more like big picture. Let's start big, broad strokes, and then we'll whittle our way down to the tiny details. But like, we need to just, we don't even talk flowers in the first couple of meetings. That's kind of not even, not even a thing necessarily. And it, cause, and for me, it's like, before I, before I know what flowers I'm going to use, I need to know what backdrop I'm going to create to show off those flowers. So I don't know if it's an unorthodox approach. I think it's a little bit more of an interior design approach to events because like I said, you know, my love is interiors and gardens and, and, and space and kind of creating the whole, the whole overarching vision. Can you give me a story to help illustrate this? Maybe, you know, one of your favorites or, or whatever you'd like, just kind of the, from the beginning when you meet the couple and what kind of information you got from them uh, and then how you manifested that. Oh, I, this is a fun one. This may or may not, this will answer some of those, I think. But it's, <laughs> okay. a fun, it's a fun story, nevertheless. Um, right. So I had a client six or seven years ago, and um, 
her, she really wanted to be married in Rhinebeck. Okay. So this is another thing. You're part psychologist when you're a designer. She wanted to be married in Rhinebeck. She wanted to be married in the country. She, that was her idea of the perfect wedding. Her mother and father um, are heavy hitters in the, in the interior design world here in New York. And um, they, um, because the dad was friends with Donald Trump, they insisted that the wedding had to be at Mar-a-Lago. Okay. So I remember the first meeting that I'm sitting there. I have mom on one side, kind of like not looking at the daughter, the daughter with her arms crossed, legs crossed, pouting, <laughs> looking the other direction. Yeah. And we did this whole huge, fabulous, well, well, that was kind of an awkward meeting, but it's like, you know, I, I hear both of their kind of like mom had lots of opinions, daughter had lots of opinions. And this whole idea, we're going to, you know, we're going to cover up the pool at Mar-a-Lago. The reason we're doing it at Mar-a-Lago is because, you know, my husband's good friends and we're getting it for a good deal. Like, well, that's never a great way to start a meeting. <laughs> right. um, but I'm like, this is going to be interesting. Um, and, and they're like, well, you know, and she had very grand ideas. Um, we're going to cover the pool and we're going to tent the pool area. And we're going to, you know, we had this amazing, this whole amazing, you know, over, over weeks had this whole amazing um, <clears throat> design planned out. We're going to walk in there and there's going to be boxwood hedges and the, everything was going to be a pale Dior gray. And it was just, it was just going to be like this beautiful French garden, but it was in, you know, December and blah, blah, blah. Huh. Whatever daughter was into that because you know she's like I, I'm not doing it in the ballroom. No way am I doing it in the ballroom. I'm not doing it in the ballroom. I do not want to see one of those crystal chandeliers. I don't. I hate this place. It's <laughs> disgusting. That's not what I want to do. Over and over. So we had this beautiful plan. Well, then I get the call from the daughter saying, um, "Well, my mother actually just now broke it to my father. You know, months into this process when we we're ready to begin production, that that we're doing it tinted over the pool. He said, absolutely no way. I'm not paying for that. The ballroom's accessible. This is what we're doing. You have to change everything.' And so we had to literally start back at square one. Oh month. God, yeah. So um, this was fun for me because I had, I had it was such a it was such an awkward job, and I I had tried to quit the job like three times but <laughs> okay. i'm also a sucker for punishment you know i have found out and and i'm i guess the reason i'm telling this story because there's just so many many there's so many moments in this whole relationship that that kind of to tie into who i am as a designer you know there was so much there were so many battles that had to be won there were so many problems that had to be solved there were so many you know it was such a tangled mess and as kind of awkward as it was, it was really fun as a designer because it was it was on every aspect it was problem solving one oh one from the from soup to nuts. You know, it wasn't just like this is what we're gonna do, it's gonna be pretty and we're off. Like everything, production, timing, budget, like But like what like what, Lewis? What were one of the biggest problems you had to solve? They didn't they they, they had fabulous caviar taste and they just didn't they just didn't like to part with their money you know like we had that that's always a huge thing so a lot of like that that combined with um with mother having very strong ideas and a daughter having very different ideas so having to create this environment that had that felt more youthful and relaxed while still giving the mom the kind of pomp and circumstance that she required um while working in a complicated place that's you know in Southern Florida. Um, so logistical design idea, design, everything was sort of like, it was, a, it was, it was difficult, but we really, we, had, we figured out a good plan. It was going to be a great design. Everybody was excited about it. And then they dropped that bomb that it wasn't going to be there. It was going to have to be inside the ballroom, which the ballroom is disgusting. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's like the size of, you know, like four football stadiums, but it all looks like it's, you know, made out of, you know, cheap marble and really cheap light fixtures that are about 20 feet tall. And it, and that's, it's not pretty. So, so it was, um, it, you know, I'm, so there we're sitting and it was like, it was really this moment where like, you know, I, I need to like, just be the designer here and just set down. Like, it's enough of asking, what do you want? What do you want? I have to, I, we have no choice here other than the fact that I have to say, this is what we're going to yeah. do because we have no choice. Yeah. And so, and so I said, this is what we're going to do because we have no choice. We're going to put up a tent frame in the middle of this ballroom and we're going to drape the entire tent in black fabric. Huh. And they kind of looked at me like, huh, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. well, first of all, we have the space, so let's just create a whole new space. Secondly, 
I've always wanted to do a black tent. Like if we do this black, it now becomes negative space and everything we bring in and shine light onto it. Oh, interesting. It is, is the, um, is what we're looking at. Yeah. So don't think of it as a black tent being like morbid. Think about it as, as negative space being like the night sky. Well, it's like a green screen. It's like a green screen. Yeah. yeah it's like the night sky. Then you put a star in the night sky. Yeah. What are you looking at? You're looking at the star. You're yeah. Not looking at the black space around it. So. They, well, because maybe they didn't have many choices, you know, they were very open to the idea and then they got very excited about it and ended up being one of the most satisfyingly crazy fun jobs was to walk in there and raise a black tent in the middle of Donald Trump's ballroom. Yeah. For everybody, it's very different. You know, I think that what I deal with a lot, and I think every designer is going to have the same, probably have the same experience is that, you know, you're dealing, especially when you get into the money set, you're dealing with a lot of personalities. So dad's paying the bill and he's got some ideas. And then, you know, in some cases it's dad and it's the stepmom and it's the mother who's the divorcee, who's got slightly cranky and, but they all have to be in the same room. And then you have the daughter and then you have the fiance. And then at some point the fiance's parents are dragged in and they're, You've got like everybody coming from all walks of life and they all have a, a very strong point of view. So it's a lot of mental calisthenics <laughs> and design. You know, you have to keep an elastic brain to, to make it all happen. Yeah. You know, it's funny to this day. I mean, look, I have a daughter and if, if one day I, I pay for her wedding, if I were to do that, I'm not all I'm going to do is say, here's the budget. Here's what I'm willing to put in. Do whatever else you would like. And do whatever you want with it. If you would love my advice, because I know something about the industry, let me know. Otherwise, I mean, it's her wedding. I don't understand these parents. Well, that's a very that's a very wise and giving father. I mean, it's <laughs> odd, but you know, a lot about a lot of them aren't. It's about the parents a lot, or the mother a lot. Well, it is about the parents, yeah. and it's about who's coming to the wedding, yeah. and it's about the social group, and it's about right. you know, you just it's it seems as it seems so old fashioned, but it really it's interesting it's just how how it goes. What about the business side of it? Because, you know, for you to have the level of success that you do have, obviously it's more than just the creativity, you know, and how do you, how do you balance the creativity with the business aspect, ha having created what you've created, you know, how do you view that? That's, that's been, you know, that's honestly kind of been one of my biggest struggles is that when I started this business, I started it with my partner at the time, and then we were doing it together. And he was more of the silent partner and would take care of kind of more of the business aspect, and I could be more creative. And then that really erupted and went very, very wrong about 10 years ago. Um, and then I just realized all of a sudden, like, you know, geez, like I never signed up for this. I'm like, now I'm, now I'm not only designer and meeting with clients, but I'm also human resources. And I'm like, I've got employees. Yeah. It's just like, I've got to sign the checks and like talk to the, you know, figure out the insurance policies and all these things, all these things. Now, my dad is a very, very good businessman. He's been very successful. I'm definitely more of a creative type and I'm, I'm, I don't have his business sense, but I have what I have learned from him and what I know from my own personal experience is that I'm a very conservative, I'm very conservative when it comes to business. You know, I, I don't do debt of any type. Um, you know, like I, I, the philosophy is it's better to have people owe you than to have you owe people. And it's like, I keep my, keep my overhead low and I keep my personal, you know, my personal lifestyle. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want, I'm very scared of having to, of having to like maintain something, that's just for show and the cost and the expense yeah. that goes into that. Yeah. And um, that served me well because, you know, it's from, from the simple facts of that, you know, our bills get paid. Like my Amex get, bills gets paid every week, right. not every month, because I can't deal with that huge number once a month. I have a heart attack. Yeah. You know, I like to stay right. ahead of Oh, me. I can relate to that. And that's, you know, jumping ahead. I'm sure we're going to talk about COVID at some point. Yes. But that's, that's also what has kept my business alive is the fact that two years ago, you know, I had to, I moved from my space in the West Village, which was much larger. And long story short, because of a kind of a, the landlord was a dick and he didn't do his due diligence in, sub, in submitting the, um, the analysis of the kind of the building appraisal to the city, we were hit with these huge property taxes oh, in our first year. And then 10 years, you know, I had a 10 year lease. And so basically ended up spending, you know, I left spending about $30,000 a month. That's where I was oh on, on rents and o overhead and I know just rent and, and facilities yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, this is, this is 
crap, I'm yeah. not doing this anymore. And so I, you know, I was, I was kind of laughing to my friends, like I'm the only person I know whose idea of success is moving into a smaller space, you know, instead of like, Oh, we're doing great. Let's get a bigger space and have a nicer, let's have a waiting room and a little kitchen. I'm like, no, we're moving to a fourth floor walk up and we're going to have our rent's going to be $6,000 a month. Oh. And we have a month to month. We'll wear a handshake. God, Lewis, and that's what saved great. my business because yeah. I had, I had, I had, I been in that old, that situation had COVID happened three right. years ago when right. I was in that place. I, he, I, would have been out of business within a month. What great it just timing. Been, My gosh. I mean, it's like, honestly, it's like we had to skin the fat. We, we really pared down. I feel like every couple of years, it's always just like, okay, let's look at this. Let's cut the fat, cut the fat. Let's like visually clean things up and let's, you know, financially clean things up. Let's go through like, where are we leaking funds? So I think that's been, you know, and then, then I'm free to like, you know, waste money on other things. And by that, I mean, like, I don't want, I'm not a designer who wants to go to a client and be like, oh, well, we added this extra little arrangement here on your side table. I'm going to post bill you for that. It's sort of like, no, I, you're hiring me to do a job and I'm not, I don't want to nickel and dime. And I don't want to feel like I don't have the right stuff. Like we've agreed on something now I have to do it. And if I didn't make it, if I, you know, and if I, maybe if, if you know, it, some jobs I'm going to make more on some jobs I'm going to make less on, but at the end of the day, it has to have, you know, kind of the level of, um, I guess, abundance that I, that I like. Mm. And, you know, and so that's, I'd rather, you know, spend my money on that or spend my money on doing flower flashes or things like that than spending money on, you know, having a, a receptionist. <laughs> yeah, no, I, the timing is great. And before we wrap up, you know, I want to mention there's a great, uh, I don't know if it's a TEDx talk or it's like a TEDx talk, The Power of Flowers you gave, which I thought was great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was a TEDx talk. That was last November. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I would encourage people to see that. We'll, you know, have to put a link in the show notes. What you know, there's one more topic I want to cover before we go to, Lewis, which is social media. You have a very impressive uh, following. How... I mean, look, the photos are stunning, so I understand. But still, is there something that you're – what are you doing that's helping <laughs> facilitate build your a following oh, like that? God, if I knew, I could make a – I could sell the secret for a lot of money. Because, you know, Arini, my uh, – Arini Arrakis, who works with me, she's in charge of social media and my special projects. So her and I work very closely. And she started with me about four years ago and we were, we were, we were starting the, the social, the Instagram game. And we, you know, I just remember at the very beginning, we're like, what, you know, what, what the hell, what do we do? It's like social media is like, like a person you really want to date, but is not paying you any attention. You think you're doing the right <laughs> thing and you're going to get a lot of likes yeah. and it's like, it falls flat right. or you do, or you do something that's no big deal. And suddenly 15,000 people like it, you know? So geez, I wish I had an answer because it would made our lives a lot easier. There is, it's, it's a game. It's a puzzle. I do think that, you know, it has to, from, I don't know for other people because I, 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 I'm not a big, I don't like Instagram personally or Facebook. I find it, especially in these times, I find it's just more noise in a very noisy world we live in. Um, you know, I, I know that it has to, if something is not a hundred percent authentic, how, whatever, whatever reason people can totally sense it. I mean, I, I look at other people who to post all kinds of bullshit stuff, not necessarily in the flower industry, but whatever. And it's like, oh, these are such players. And they have like 100,000 people like it. But if I do one thing that's a, a slightly off tune and I know it's not quite right, like it's like I'm called to <laughs> – like it's like it, they can tell, you know. And so I don't know. I honestly don't know. People like flowers. People, you know, definitely the flower flashes are – are what get the most likes. Yeah, I get um, that. That's just like that. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts right. about it, you know. And it's like, and people, people like the trash cans more than anything else. So it's just like it is what it is, and you know, I, 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 who knows? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think you hit on it because you know, I, I mean, I love all the pictures, but especially. Uh, what you're talking about the 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 flower uh, flashes the, those pictures are are really something. So yeah, you better keep that going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, it, and that's what I like about them. It feels, you know, I, that makes me happy about them. Is it does feel like something that's just not something you've seen. Like I can post pretty close ups of pictures, but then you know, I go to my own feed. There's ten thousand other pictures. Everybody else is doing the same thing. So it's like it's pretty, but after a while, your you know your eye becomes immune to pretty, and you need to see something bigger so yeah that's where they seem to kind of you know, i guess cut through to that yeah well that's good well 
Man, I really appreciate you um, doing this, Lewis. It's great to hear your story. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so thanks. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Andy. My pleasure, too. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Lewis Miller. Be sure to check out his website, which is lewismillerdesign.com. You can find him on Instagram at lewismillerdesign. And be sure to check out the show notes and you can find event picks that Lewis provided at our website of theweddingbiz.com and search for the September 21st, 1920 release, where you, again, you can find a lot of wonderful photos. And next week, I'm going to have a new conversation with Alex LaRue, CEO of ALR Music. And finally, I just want to say that I love hearing from you, the listener. So feel free to DM me on Instagram at The Wedding Biz. I will definitely get back to you and we'll catch you next week.